Hello everyone and welcome back to another valuation uh, from the old school value spreadsheet. I want to thank everybody for the comments they left in the last video for Bed Bath & Beyond. I appreciate the feedback that I got. And I wanted to to use that feedback and go into another company this, this time around. Uh, last time we went through a retailer. This time we're going to go through a enterprise solutions company, Oracle. Uh, big company. Uh, as you can see here, they're valued at $167 billion. So they are one of the largest companies in the world out there. And what do they do? Uh, Oracle has a ton of different businesses out there. Uh, mainly what their business is is surrounding databases. So they are a big data company. They They help companies aggregate all the financials and human resources and all the other data they have in their companies organized into these databases so it's easy to retrieve, easy to use, easy to analyze. Um, so that's their business is that they they help companies be more intelligent and their software does that so they make their revenue based upon companies going out and paying a license fee a recurring fee every year or month or or however it's set up to use their their software and they license it out. Uh, they're also in the IT sector which means that they are constantly in competition with other software companies. It's a highly competitive industry. So there's going to be a lot of competition out there for their services. And as we know software can become obsolete very quickly so that's something we'll have to keep in mind as well when we're looking at this. But when we think about Oracle we think mainly about databases and what they do. Um, for the companies out there every day anybody who works for a big company knows that they go into a system and they they look in these databases every day they're pulling data in they're analyzing it they're slicing it uh, they're making decisions based upon it so this is a critical component for every business that's out there which is important for their economic mode um, one of the things that I found in looking at this company is if you go to any IT person and you say how difficult is it for you to switch from your current IT database provider to a competitor and they say it's extremely difficult. It costs millions if not hundreds of millions of dollars to change from one system to another. Uh, just because your, your workers are used to using one system, the data is all aggregated in a certain way to accommodate uh, the current database system. So once a company like Oracle or SAP or IBM has their has their hooks in the company and has their database uh, set up, they're, they're in there for the long haul and they'd have to do something really drastic for a company to change over to uh, a competitor. So that's, that's important to know that there is a high switching cost in this industry. So any revenue that, that Oracle or any of its competitors has today is, um, is stable and it's probably going to be there for the next year so really their sales force is not about maintaining the sales with current customers it's about going out and getting new business which is good for growth prospects so sales sales people are offensive now and they're and they're going out and growing the company as opposed to trying to keep its status quo so that's gonna be important when we look at look at Oracle um, up here right now I have their 10k from Edgar online which you can go through Yahoo Finance to find all of these and I just wanted to show real quick all of the different pieces that they have out there. Uh, Oracle cl and cloud computing, uh, which seems to be all the rage on, on how data is stored now in the cloud. Uh, engineering, uh, database management, uh, software, new software licensing, uh, database and middleware software. Uh, keep going down here. Business intelligence. Uh, service oriented architecture a lot of this stuff I have no idea what it means and that's going to come into play whenever I'm doing my valuation as well as how well do I understand the business how tight is it to my my sphere of competence so I'm going to take that into account here when I'm reading through this how easy is this to understand uh, management portals uh, Java I understand that that is a software a type of software programming language um, but a lot of this stuff I don't really understand so I'm going to take that into account whenever I'm, I'm doing my valuation, whether or not I want to uh, invest in, in Oracle. 
So we go through here, and you can just see it just keeps going and going and going, all, all the different types of businesses they are. And that would make sense in a $167 billion company. They're going to have multiple streams of revenue out there. Uh, servers, storage, um, hardware system, business services, consulting, uh, education, all, all types of different businesses that are out there in their 10K. So there's a wide array, but they all center around a single point of being a data aggregator and uh, data organizer for companies and intelligence uh, creator for businesses. So that's their value add is that they they take all the data that's out there and they they put it into a a system where companies can make intelligent decisions based upon the data that they have. So we go to our old school value spreadsheet here and we look at, at what what they have going on. Um, again, this is the dashboard here, and we can go through a quick high-level uh, comparison here on how they're doing. But before we do that, why don't we go real quick to the ratios here? Um, we can go to our price to cash flow. It looks like they're they're at 10 times, 13 times free cash flow, which is a good sign. How's the return on equity looking? Um, that's pretty strong. They're they're over 20 every year, except for 2010, which they're right about 20 percent every year. That's that's a positive sign. That they they're generating returns for the shareholders. Returns on assets is uh is pretty strong. Uh, the return on invested capital and cash return on invested capital both very very high. Uh, highs in the in the 20s in some cases, except there's this outlier here in 2004. Uh, looks like something weird happened in those those couple of years, but if you look here, it's been pretty pretty stable and fair, pretty strong over the last eight years. So there's been a nice return in this company, which is which is a good sign. How is their how are their liquidity ratios doing? Um, quick and current ratios very high, always over one. They have they have enough cash to to cover their debts or not, current assets to cover their debts. So that's positive. What's their debt to equity ratio? Last time we looked at Bed Bath Beyond, we had no debt. Uh, Oracle has some. They have some long-term debt and some and some short-term debt out there that's that's on the books. Uh, but it doesn't look too too crazy. It doesn't look like there's that much out there. But there's some, uh, which isn't a bad thing. Uh, I like to see lower debt, but that's okay. They're using some debt to leverage, and especially when they're getting the returns that they are on there on their investments and their capital investments uh... using some leverage can be okay so when we look at day sales out seeing our liquidity ratios and, and our cash conversion cycle uh... they're getting their cash quicker than they were before it used to be in the eighties and now we're down into the to the sixties here's some inventory if you look at inventory outstanding here they were at zero because they were a software provider. They didn't have inventory. And then they, in 2010, they started to get into the hardware area. Now they start to build up some inventory. And you can see here that um, how much inventory they have outstanding. It's a very small number compared to their whole business because it makes sense that they have a lot of, a lot of software business as well. Um, and then days payable outstanding, you can see that they're, that's come down a little bit as well. <clears throat> so we got around 20 days. So I wanted to talk about what's the cash conversion cycle as, as well in this so that we can understand what this means. Cash conversion cycle is how fast do we go from getting our inventory to converting it into a dollar. We decide to make a decision that we're going to sell widgets how fast from the point in time where we say okay we're gonna buy widgets and sell them to we get cash in the door how quickly does that happen um, so how, how long how long is our cash gonna be sitting out there exposed to to the economic climate um, we spend money to buy inventory and then we hopefully sell it for more later on to to make a profit so the cash conversion cycle shows us how long are we exposed in that in that cycle? Um, so the basic calculation is is we make a decision to buy inventory. So we decide, okay, we need some inventory, and we get the inventory in our warehouse, and it's going to sit there for a certain number of days. 
and that's our days inventory outstanding. So in this case, if you look at the trailing 12 months, <clears throat> we have inventory. It's going to sit out there for eight days. So it's going to come in the warehouse, and then eight days later, it's going to go out as as a sale. Okay, so on day eight, it's, it's out the door. That's great. Um, however, from that point where it becomes a sale, it takes us 43 days to get paid on it. So we sold it. But then we send the invoice out and our customer pays us 43 days later. So from the point in time where we say inventory hits our warehouse to the point in time where we have cash hitting our checking account, it's going to be 51.1 days <clears throat> before, we get it, before we get the cash. However, we don't pay for it right away. Uh, we order the inventory and then we're going to pay for it at some point in the future. Uh, they're going to send us an invoice for it. Uh, and that happens to be 18 days. So on day one, we get the inventory in our warehouse. Day eight, it goes out the door. Ten days later, we get the invoice for it. So on day 18, we're paying our vendor for that inventory that we have out there. And then on day 43, we're going to receive cash that we, that we earned for selling that product. So if you add these up, the inventory uh, and the sales outstanding, you get your 51.1, and then you subtract out those, eight, those 18 days and you get 33 days. So that means that there are 33 days where we've spent money on our product and we have not received payment for those, those uh, products so far. Uh, the smaller this number is, the smaller number of days we need to finance our operations. If we're getting paid before we have to pay out the bill, um, that's a good thing. We have cash in the door before we even have to pay the bill. And grocery stores are one of the one of the best examples of this. They're buying product all the time and they're selling it, hopefully, before uh, they're getting the bill for that inventory. If you think about uh, milk that they may buy, they may sell that in a couple of days, but they're not getting the bill for 30 days or so. So the sale is done and the cash is in the door before they even have to pay it out. So that's a good thing whenever this cash conversion cycle is shrinking and you don't have to finance the operations um, just based upon the timing of the billing and the payments. So that was just a, a tangent on what cash conversion cycle is. So we have 50 days, 56 days, 65 days, um, and we keep coming down here, and now it's, it's around 49 uh, 33 days so it, it's in line with with what's been happening so far there's no real jumps out there uh, again we set our long-term debt structure 55% uh, for versus invested capital and short-term debt so let's go through the statements real quick again we're gonna start with the balance sheet see what's happening there okay start at the top we have cash and uh, cash equivalents look at this and you can see that it's been growing every year they've been increasing their balance sheet their top of their balance sheet every year so they're they're hoarding cash um, or they're they're gathering up assets and what's also interesting too is not just cash and cash equivalents but they're also building up short-term investments as well out there um, so they're investing the cash they're being uh, they're trying to generate a return on their cash they're not just sitting on the balance sheet and what does this mean? Why are they not just investing in the company again or paying out a dividend? Uh, in a lot of cases, this is because it's, it's international and you have to repatriate those funds back to the U.S. and pay taxes on it. So what happens is these, these uh, investments or these returns from, from our international operations get stuck. They get stuck in our international uh, business and they can't be repatriated because then there's a tax consequence on them. So what happens is they end up sitting out there uh, on our balance sheet as a short-term investment because we take them and we invest in treasury bonds or some sort of uh, equity or some other corporate type bond out there uh, so we can generate some sort of return on it while we're avoiding paying the the increased taxes on repatriating that money. And you can see this this is true in Microsoft as well. So when you look at those two companies and any company with international operations, you may see this this buildup of short-term investments because cash can't come back to the U.S. because there's this massive tax consequence out there. Um, so we look at receivables also. Looks like everything's in line there. It's not nothing too too crazy. Um, but current assets, we can see that they're 
they're slowly growing over time, building it up for 40 billion. So we've got a lot of current assets out there. Um, not a lot of fixed assets either. 